So the program will, will continue. And uh, to start, I will ask uh, to come on the podium with me the Professor Jam Swatch, if he's there, maybe he's there. No, he's coming. Thank you, Professor. You are from Northwestern University. Yes. You are from Chicago. I, can, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Uh, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Mm -hmm. This is a very exciting event. I have done a lot of research about Telstar and about the space race and about global communications. So uh, what can I say? It's wonderful that this event is taking place today. Okay, you continue to speak in a couple of seconds. I want to talk uh, David Richards from Margaret Cheese Library of Maine. Thank you for coming. If you can sit there and wait a second. And uh, Michael Gezelovich from New York. And um, you, you, you are going to speak, of course, about this fantastic anniversary of Telstar One. The first question is going to be for you. Please sit, gentlemen. Do you think this f first launch in 1962 changed the profile of the world? Thank, thank you. And that's a very good question to start things out with. Welcome, everybody. And I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the context and place of Telstar in the space race. Uh, the next slide, please. Even before Telstar, there were many ideas and plans for how to bridge the Atlantic Ocean with telecommunications and television. And this map from the early 1950s represents attempts with microwave relay, undersea cables, and even plans to have airplanes on aircraft carriers with transmitters in the airplane circling above the ocean. This all preceded Telstar. Next slide, please. As others have mentioned, a major part of the Telstar endeavor was the Earth stations or the satellite dishes. And the Telstar network, if you will, began with four of these Earth stations, one in Great Britain and Goonhilly. The next slide, please. And of course, the Radom and Premier Baudou. Next slide, please. And in the United States, there were actually two locations used, the location in Andover and in an earlier receiving station that had been built in Homedale, New Jersey. Next slide, please. The Telstar orbit was not a geosynchronous orbit, meaning Telstar could not be used round the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but was used only when Telstar passed over the North Atlantic Ocean, which meant Telstar was used for 10 to 30 minutes at most on each one of its orbits. Next slide, please. As we've discussed earlier today, the first international relay takes place on the 11th of July, including an image of the American flag, and also including um, a a television broadcast inside the United States with Vice President Lyndon Johnson and many other dignitaries. The next slide, please. Then there was a relay from France, Jacques Moret saying, relax, you are in Paris and I invite you to spend a few pleasant moments with me. Uh, that happened to be the New York Times quote of the day uh, in the newspapers that day. Next slide, please. This led to a summer where, in a fall of 1962, where Telstar was regularly in the news. Uh, there were many different kinds of international television exchanges and broadcasts between the United States and Europe, including some spectacular or special events uh, that it showed America the sights of Europe and Europe the sights of America. The next slide, please. And there were cultural controversies, if you will, uh, Telstar rocked the fashion world by showing photographs of the 1962 fall Paris uh, clothes designs earlier than they were supposed to be released and earlier than they had ever been released before. There's many of these kinds of stories. And many European viewers of, tel of American news via Telstar were shocked by the hard-boiled nature of American news. I 
found this quote in a USIA report, uh, Telstar is forcing all of us to become world citizens and it's also removing some of the romantic aura of distance. And this is again, again another thing we've lived with yeah, in the 50 years of Telstar. Next slide, please. And, and Telstar was a darling of popular culture. Uh, there were uh, children's pajamas, high school sports teams, family pets, firecrackers, automobile tires, all these named after Telstar and the number one song in the United States uh, on Top 40 Radio in 1962 was an instrumental called Telstar done by the Tornadoes and many other bands. Next slide, please. One other thing I want to talk about is that Telstar actually had a double or a dual mission. It was primarily a communication satellite, but it also carried a scientific package to measure excess radiation in the upper atmospheres and outer space. This included in the Van Allen belts, which had only recently been determined or discovered, but it also included the testing of atomic weapons. And this was an era when both the United States and the Soviet Union tested atomic weapons above ground and also in outer space, 50 to 100, 200 miles up. Next slide, please. Indeed, two days before the Telstar launch, the United States had done a high altitude atomic weapons test. And you get this headline in the San Francisco Chronicle. Next slide, please to be followed two days later by this headline in the San Francisco Chronicle, and this was being reported by newspapers all over the world. Among the many things happening from these high altitude atomic weapons tests were uh, that they damaged some satellites and Telstar did sustain some damage. Next slide, please. In October of 1962, the space race, Telstar, and atomic weapons testing come together in very interesting ways. You have the Walter Schirra mission, which is the first time Europe sees any portion of a space mission, whether it's the United States or Soviet Union, live on television. Telstar showed the launch. And you also had a high altitude atomic weapons test the day before that launch. Next slide, please. Well, in 1963, the world, United States, Soviet Union, and many other countries signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty, banning high altitude and all above ground atomic weapons testing. In this way, we see Telstar also as part of the story of the taking of weapons out of space, the disarmament of space, and we also see the beginnings of using space satellites as a tool for disarmament and a tool for promoting world peace. Next slide, please. We move on to the 24-hour-a-day geosynchronous satellites by 1965. Next slide. We have the growth of global consciousness throughout the 60s as part of this, one of the famous Earthrise images from Apollo 8. Next slide. And we reach our 21st century world, a world where the skies are filled with satellites. This, this shows satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Next slide, please. And we discover new 21st century problems such as space debris. Telstar is part of space debris. It still orbits the Earth. It is expected to order, orbit for another 150 years. Next slide, please. And so the legacy of Telstar is everywhere in the 21st century, in our global broadband networks, our global media and global culture, in our global security and disarmament, and indeed in our global consciousness. And in conclusion, next slide. I say happy anniversary to Telstar. Thank you, everybody. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a number I don't get it uh, well. How much was the cost of the first call by the vice president? Well, that, that, that was done for free because, <laughs> they, the, because the telephone company was uh, providing free service that day to those who used Telstar. But the costs were very expensive. And the costs for television were extraordinarily expensive as well in the first couple of years. They said $50 million, is that correct? Well, if you, if that could easily be the cost include, if you include all the equipment to, com, to complete the call. Okay. So, thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Please come on the, on the podium. I introduce David Richards. And uh, you're going to talk about uh, 
maybe the importance of the state of Maine in, yes. this, uh, in this challenge. Please. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the Smithsonian for the opportunity to be here today and the Embassy of France as well. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, to talk about the senator and the satellite. I'm going to start in what might seem like a very odd place to you. I'm going to start on Margaret Chase's, she hasn't married Clyde Smith yet, Margaret Chase's sixth birthday on December 14th, 1903. Because on that day, down in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, two brothers tried out a new invention. And they weren't successful on that day, but three days later, the Wright brothers successfully flew the first airplane. And I say that because that's what Margaret Chase Smith grew up with. That was the big thing that she grew up with. If you can go to the next slide, you'll actually see um, a record of that first flight. Uh, and again, I think it's very important to realize that she had a lifelong interest in aviation. Next. We're going to skip ahead about 20 years. And at that time, Margaret Chase Smith is a cub reporter uh, for the newspaper in her hometown of Skowhegan, Maine. And at that time, there was a man named Walter Cleveland who had an air service. You see a picture of his biplane with his name on it. And he served northern New England. And he was trying to drum up business. And the way that he did that is when he came to a new community, he would seek out a journalist. Because he knew if he took a reporter up, that after they took the flight, uh, they would write about it. And that's what Margaret Chase Smith did. Uh, her article was called Up Above the World So High. Uh, I've highlighted uh, some of the emotions that she felt as she was on this trip. But again, this is to let you realize that uh, she wasn't just coming to Telstar newly in 1957, that she did have this lifelong interest in aviation, a wind through your hair interest in aviation. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And that brings us to 1957 with uh, Sputnik and um, what she called the Red Moon. So sorry. And that had two consequences. We can go to the next slide. Uh, the first consequence is that Senator Smith is very concerned, being on the um, Armed Services Committee, of what the state of our aviation and aeronautics is in 1957 because the Soviet Union has beat us into space. Uh, so she embarks on a trip across the United States visiting defense contractors. And this particular incident is when she goes to Los Angeles and uh, goes to North American Aviation. And uh, one of the things she wants to do is fly in an F-100F Super Sabre jet and break the sound barrier. And that's what the article on the left is about. And it's very interesting. The article, in many ways, uh, is very connected to uh, the article that she wrote in 1925, what some of her experiences of this flight were. Uh, and then on the right, you have a picture of the pilot who took her on this flight, uh, Clyde Good, Major Clyde Good, and the chairman of North American Aviation, uh, Dutch Kindleberger. And at that time, he said to Senator Smith, uh, you know, North American Aviation, we can take you into space as well. And at that time, she said that she would like to do that. And I think that was a very serious thing, because again, uh, she had a very hands-on interest in aviation. Next slide. Second consequence of Sputnik is that uh, Congress at this time creates the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee, which as you can see, Senator Smith said that was the most desired committee in uh, the United States Senate. She gets appointed as one of the charter members of the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee, and she serves on it from 1958 until she leaves Congress in 1973. So she oversees all the big projects in addition to Telstar, um, Project Mercury, Project Gemini, Project Apollo, even the beginnings of the space shuttle program. Next slide. At that time, in 1957, her interest in uh, space uh, is very much a part of the space race, the Cold War. Uh, this is uh, a quote from a talk she gave to a Baptist group in Pittsfield, Maine, home of Chinbro in 1957. And you can see she's highlighting that uh, we're in a competition with this godless country. Uh, Russia. Next slide, please. Now we get to Telstar. That's some of the background of showing you her lifelong interest that she had in space. Uh, this is actually a souvenir that she was given uh, on the day the, of the first transmission on July 10th, uh, 1962. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, a 
what the press release she had on that day on July 10th um, as they convened at the Carnegie Institution to watch uh, the first transmission and she highlights uh, what, why she was so interested in Telstar. She had a personal connection. She had once been a telephone operator. I'll talk more about that. Uh, she also thought it was very important that it was an example of a public private partnership that the government and private industry were involved in space and she thought that really should be the model for how um, space was developed. And then a third reason was she was very proud of the state of Maine's connection uh, to Telstar, which you've already heard some about, and I'll talk more. Next, please. Uh, you can see from this cartoon on the left uh, from 1947 that Margaret Chase Smith had once been a telephone operator. And um, in a statement that she made on the floor of the United States Senate a couple days after Telstar, July 12, 1962, she talks about how during this event her thoughts flash back many years ago to those nights when I was a switchboard operator in my hometown of Skowhegan. Next, please. Uh, here's a picture of uh, the Earth Station at Andover, Maine. Again, she was very proud of Maine's connection uh, to the Earth Station. Uh, Andover is in the northwest corner of Maine. It's a fairly isolated place, which made it an uh, ideal design uh, because there'd be less interference. Uh, you can see from the picture on the right that there are mountains in the background and actually if you could do a 360 panorama you can see that it's completely encircled by mountains. So it created a, a valley, it created a bowl um, that uh, protected it from any outside interference in terms of microwave signals. And the other factor is that Maine is obviously the closest point in the continental United States to Europe. So that also made it uh, an ideal setting uh, for Telstar star receiving station in the state of Maine. Next, please. This is a newspaper photograph of, of the night of the transmission, which was on uh, July 10th, but it actually would have been received in France on Ju July 11th. Uh, and it gives you a sense of Senator Smith's stature. You can see in the front row, you have Vice President Lyndon Johnson, you have the president of AT&T. Next to him is Senator Robert Kerr of Oklahoma, who also served on the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith, Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois, and Representative Carl Albert of Oklahoma. And there again is Margaret Chase Smith there, right there in the front row, very proud of uh, Maine's connection to this event taking place that night. Next slide. And as you've seen earlier, actually a video of it, um, this is the first image that becomes transmitted. Uh, the United States flag flying in Andover, Maine, uh, the state that Margaret Chase Smith serves. And I just have two slides at the end that try to sort of sum up um, Telstar and Margaret Chase Smith's interest in space. So if you can go to the next one. This is from a longer piece that she was asked to write in 1967 for an Encyclopedia of Aviation and Space Sciences. And it really highlights the three reasons Margaret Chase Smith thought America should be very involved in this project. Uh, one was the scientific and technological benefits that spun out of the space program. You see several highlighted here, one of which is the communication satellite systems, um, others as well, computers, weather forecasting. Um, there is the factor of the space race, this competition that we were having with the Soviet Union and uh, very much a product of the Cold War. But then there was a third reason that she thought was very important, and that was uh, the benefit to education, that she thought this was something that inspired young people. She understood the importance of st STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, long before many other people did. And then one final slide. Uh, because of her very strong interest in space, some of her friends and fans um, gave her this presentation right here, this little award. Some of those friends uh, were people like Senator Mike Mansfield, who was the Senate Majority Leader from uh, Montana, and uh, Senator George Aiken from Vermont, uh, referring to her as the space age senator who reached for the stars. And as I say, I think that really went all the way back since she was six years old growing up with this new uh, technology of, of aviation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. David uh, Richards. Now we're going to talk a little bit about history, probably. Can you join us in the, on the podium? Michael Gazelovich from IEEE. What is that? Very good. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but while they're putting up my slides, Philippe, um, you couldn't have known earlier. I want to thank you for the language lesson. Um, but you'll notice in my talk, and you said, I, avoid, I avoid saying it. Um, my wife happens to be a teacher of French, and I have no French. 
and we have a deal that I'm not even allowed to try and pronounce French names or words in our house. So <laughs> Thank you. I will, I will just talk about Brittany, and I'll, I'll avoid mentioning the, the, the word. Um, <laughs> if I could have the next, please, and the next. Um, so my question for myself for today was, why am I being asked to speak when we've heard um, all these other illustrious people and, and these scholars talk about all the aspects of Telstar, and in fact, uh, you're going to see a lot of the same images and, and hear a lot of the same facts. And I decide the reason is because I do represent the IEEE, as Fleet said very well, um, which is the world's largest professional association. It's the association for um, engineers worldwide, 400,000 members in 165 countries, including, of course, a section in France, as well as many sections in the United States. Uh, next, please. Um, and the engineers feel it's their obligation to preserve their history and to make it known. Um, so my, pre my presentation is going to be different. It's going to focus a little more on the people. We've talked about the impact on people, meaning us, the lay people, how our lives have been transformed by Telstar. But there were people behind it. Of course, there were politicians like, like uh, Margaret Chase Smith that we just heard. Um, but there's also an army of engineers, technicians, and scientists. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about them. Next, please. Um, so we, to do this, um, we do a range of activities, we do oral histories, we just published a book about, uh, with some uh, memoirs from Bell Labs employees, uh, I'm going to come back to Bell Labs in just a moment. Um, we actually recognized Telstar on the 40th anniversary 10 years ago, um, so if you'd like to, and that was also uh, broadcast by satellite three-way, uh, we also included the UK as well as France and Maine, I was up at the Maine uh, leg for that one, and the video is available on our, on our site um, if you're interested. Next, click. That's the uh, plaque that we placed in, uh, in uh, Andover, Maine to commemorate the event. Um, the Maine section felt strongly that even at the 40th anniversary that they were losing a lot of the people who had worked on the radome and we held it then and of course um, two days ago at Bell Labs in New Jersey they also held a ceremony and there were some pioneers there but we, you know of course at that, if you think do the arithmetic we lose some of these engineers and scientists each year so we were happy to commemorate them then. Next. Um, and of course, we miss those who are no longer with us. Next, please. Um, OK, next. Um, when we did that celebration, I got back to my office and I got a call from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Next. Um, they have something called an Engineering and Technology Committee that actually, if for those who don't know, uh, well, you'll, you'll see in a moment. I well, don't want to spoil my surprise. Next. Um, they asked us to prepare a nomination for a Historical Technology and Engineering Award. When you watch the Emmy program, you only see the actors, and I guess maybe some directors or something. But they have a dinner the night before where they give out a range of other awards for the behind-the-camera people, including a technology award. And Telstar was given a lifetime, but you could say posthumously, lifetime achievement award for how it transformed um, television. Uh, next. Um, that's what the Emmy looks like. Uh, and next, please. Just for contrast, you can tell that um, in the year that uh, Telstar launched, uh, Jack Benny won the Emmy for Best Comedy. And in the year that Telstar finally achieved its Emmy, it shared it with Ray Romano. Again, he was on a different night. But Everyone Loves Raymond was the, was the number one comedy um, that year. So how did this come about? Next. Um, next, please. Actually, you can uh, do one, another one, another one, and another one. I didn't know that we wouldn't have a clicker, so I put trans, uh, excuse me, I put um, transitions in my uh, PowerPoint, so I apologize for that. Obviously, right up until World War II, radio communication for voice and image and a range of things was, was, was already transforming the world, right? So there already was transatlantic radio, and there was radio telephone and so forth. There was two-way radio. Television had just, had, was just really beginning, beginning to blossom. Then, of course, you had the war. Next. Um, as the war wound down, of course, the war was, many people have called World War II the first technological war, where both all the sides were very strongly into research. We had, of course, the Manhattan Project. Uh, the British had the Colossus Project, so forth and so on. Very major scientific technological achievements were, took place in the context of specifically for the war effort. As the war, on the one hand, wound down, people started to think about civilian application to some extent. Next. Um, next. Um, in 1945, the futurist and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke 
propose geosynchronous communication satellites, just as an idea. Um, next. In uh, 1946, in uh, Camp uh, Evans in New Jersey, where the uh, U.S. Army Signal Corps Electronics Laboratory was, they actually bounced radio waves off the moon and detected them, which gave us a whole range of information about the possibility of space for communication. And then, as you've already heard, next two clicks, this individual, John Pierce, of Bell Telephone Laboratories, Inc., which was the research arm of AT&T, um, laid out the idea in 1955 that he thought the pieces of technology were in place to build a communication satellite. Next. Um, as was mentioned by an earlier speaker, his bosses initially did not pay close attention. Um, however, as the Cold War heated up, space became a battleground. Um, here's Sputnik. You can uh, next, and the next two. Um, project SCORE, which was an ARPA project. So in 1958, ARPA was created the Advanced Research uh, uh, Program of the Military, and NASA was created out of the earlier, uh, the earlier NACA. And um, finally, in 1960, a weather satellite was launched. And um, of course, in, uh, in also in 1960, the first communication satellite, but a passive communication satellite, something that bounced signals off itself. It did not itself take the signals and reamplify them and, se and send them down. Um, so now we get, now you see the setting for, for, for Telstar. And you have to remember that AT&T had a phone monopoly in this country, and many uh, national phone companies had monopolies in other countries, but we were the most advanced, the United States had the most advanced telephone technology. And AT&T didn't want to lose out on their monopoly when when telephony went global. Uh, next. So they agreed, they went to NASA and they agreed on a joint project. And you've heard some, again, you've heard these facts from earlier speakers, but I'll just, I'll just remind you quickly so you can, you can fill this slide. They would design a satellite. They would pay NASA for the launch. It was going to be a private launch. No one, no private individual, it's not like today with SpaceX, right? No private individual had the wherewithal to launch a satellite. Only basically at that point, the USA and USSR could do that. But it was an AT&T project. It was a private satellite that would be for telecommunications, and they would build a ground station. But as you've heard from several speakers, they opted for a variety of reasons not for a geosynchronous satellite. Therefore, they needed multiple ground stations. And the partners were the British Post Office, who you heard built a site in, in uh, Goonhilly, uh, in Cornwall, in England. And the French, of course, you've seen uh, built a radome in the place I'm not going to name. Um, and the second, uh, thank you. And the second, the second identical radome was, was of course, uh, in Andover, Maine. Next. Um, there were daunting technological barriers. Uh, next. The size and fragility of electronics in those days, if you think about the, the pressures of a satellite launch, how to power it, uh, how to integrate the system, and of course you heard uh, one of the very first speakers, the size and complexity of the Earth stations. There's the horn antenna, which was a completely new design, and of course, you needed the giant radome, which in itself, I'm, I'm representing the electro-electronic and computer engineers, but this is an amazing civil engineering accomplishment. It was the largest uh, air-supported uh, building at the time. Now we'd like to show you some of the people who solved those issues. Next. Uh, next. So uh, Eugene O'Neill, you've already said John Pierce started the project. He put Eugene O'Neill in charge of it. Uh, Rudolf Kampfner who had invented something called the traveling wave tube, which is a form of amplifier that was needed, improved on it. Friedolf Smits needed, how did they power it? They powered it with solar cells. There's lots of solar energy in space. Solar cell technology, even though it existed, was not where it needed to be. Um, and finally, I mentioned James Early, because you, uh, it was mentioned by one of my colleagues, the, uh, the dual mission of uh, the Van Allen radiation, Van Allen, another, another Bell Labs type, um, having discovered the uh, Van Allen radiation belt, the question was, what's going to happen when these components get up in space? They're going to fry. And they had to figure out how to harden the components against radiation, which, by the way, as we heard about the Cold War applications, um, this is also important if your adversaries are blowing up atomic bombs uh, and radiation is coming down and you want to have a second strike capability, so hardening components is very important. So there was a dual purpose here also. But really, they wanted to be able to send television and telephone signals without the cosmic rays fr frying them. Next. What's the result? Well, you've already seen the result many times. History was made. Next. Telstar is launched. Next. <laughs> couple. You can give me a couple. Uh, it was launched, as you heard, on uh, 10 July. That evening. Uh, next. 
President Koppel picked up the phone in Andover and spoke to Vice President at that time, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, who we also saw earlier, and Margaret Chase Smith was the speaker of, was the um, majority leader of the Senate, or minority leader at the time that she was appointed to the committee. The committee. Right. Um, and some of the other firsts that have already been mentioned uh, in, earlier, in earlier talks, uh, of course, the live television transmission to, to, to France that we've seen, transmission of tape, uh, fax. You don't think of fax, I say, as an older technology, but they were able to send faxes, so you could send a, pic, a still picture over speed. And they, they even tested high speed data, which was mentioned by an earlier speaker, not high speed by our standards, but by the standards of the day, they demonstrated that they, that they didn't lose anything by going away from a landline and actually sending signals uh, through, the, through the air and through, and through space. Uh, next slide. Um, next. So here's the image you've seen about 12 times already, that first image with the, with the uh, Andover radome um, in the background. Uh, so the rest is more history uh, beyond my scope. But if I think, if I understand this question, if you stay tuned for the next session, we're going to have some experts talking about where we are now with, with satellite communication technology. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Dr. Gazelovich, I have a question from my daughter. She's 11 years old, and she asked me why I can't find any answer for her. So I said, I come here in the Airspace Museum, I'm going to ask a question. So since how long the scientists like you know that when you project something on the cosmos or somewhere, it stay there? <laughs> um, well, that was actually predicted by scientists a long time. Long time ago? Right, but it took... What do you mean by long time ago? I mean, the Enlightenment. People like Galileo and Newton worked out the laws and kept up with the laws of planetary motion. They knew that the planets weren't falling into the sun. So they knew if you could throw a rock hard enough and high enough that it should... Or, and they knew that the moon didn't fall into the Earth, that you should be able to theoretically... In fact, if you think about the word satellite, the moon is a satellite. Satellite means a body goes around another body. We now are lazy. We've been saying satellite. What we mean is man-made or artificial satellites. So they knew it was possible, but until the Russians actually got Sputnik to orbit, it, it hadn't been proven. So hopefully she'll get the first prize in the science fair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please sit down. So now, if you have any question, you have a microphone right here in the, in the light and uh, our guests will be pleased to answer. Um, that's a good question. If you, if, if, if you look, it was such a huge comple a complex project, as was mentioned. The ground stations, the satellite itself, I mean, you had power, you had telemetry. Um, so when you, when you, if you talk or you look at the memoirs in our book or you look at the oral histories, um, each engineer is so proud and focused on what they did because there were so many firsts, so many achievements that people said couldn't be done. Again, uh, one of the, the um, it may have been um, uh, Dr. Claw, I can't remember, someone mentioned the power cord theory, that maybe you'd have to run a power cord um, up, to this, up to outer space. Um, so there were so many firsts, but if you talk to, you look at interviews of, of Pierce, and we have one in our book, or, or of O'Neill, um, they would say it was the system. I mean, this was systems engineering. Uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, I guess there's Hoover Dam, and that's distribution system. I mean, this is one of, in the history of engineering, this is one of the great systems integration uh, achievements. And as was mentioned, it was multinational. Um, you had at least two languages involved, maybe three, depending on what you think of British English. Um, you had uh, metric versus English system measurement. Uh, a whole range of issues, and, and the fact that this system could be produced is, even today, you look back and you say, yeah, how did they do it? You have other questions? Please go to the microphone. Uh, 
First, I want to say thank you for the wonderful presentations from, from uh, all of the speakers. Now that we've heard about uh, Bill Wales and the wonderful research and the innovation and the inventiveness that led to the contributions of Telstar, I recognize that Bell Labs today is now merged with the French uh, communications giant Alcatel. And the question is, how is that relationship looking at it? And what are the research initiatives now being developed between the United States and France, between the merger of Bell Labs and Alcatel? I'm a historian, uh, so I can't answer that, but I think that may be addressed in the later session to some extent. Is there gonna be one of the speakers on sort of French-US current telecommunications cooperation, I think? So, so hopefully you'll get your answer, your answer then. But as you mentioned, there was, I mean, it's a complicated corporate history, and, and there's, a, there's another book. We, in fact, we have representatives here from, from Alcatel-Lucent. Um, there's a recent book by Gertner, published by Penguin Books on, called, the, um, the Innovation Center or something like that about the issue Bell Labs, where he talks about this. Uh, it's a complicated corporate history, but Bell Labs is now part of the Alcatel-Lucent uh, situation. Ah, and here I see the Alcatel-Lucent representative. Hi, my name is Marie Royce. I'm with Alcatel-Lucent. I'm in charge of international public affairs out of Washington, D.C. And Alcatel-Lucent, of course, is, uh, also has Bell Labs. First of all, I want to uh, thank everyone for the program today and also share the fact that Al McRae, who's an outstanding scientist from AT&T, retired, was set to speak today. He was so looking forward to participating. Unfortunately, for health reasons, he wasn't able to participate. But I want to assure you that the um, merger of Alcatel-Lucent is doing very well. Um, we're in 130 countries with uh, close to 30,000 active patents, and we have many breakthrough innovations, I'll just name one recently that's uh, set to come to the market, and that's called light radio, which is very exciting. And that is where we take a uh, cell tower and we actually bring it down to something that you can hold in the palm of your hand, which means that you can actually bring broadband everywhere, uh, including on a uh, pole, on a roof, etc. So we have a number of uh, new innovations, and uh, we have a, an excellent relationship, and now the company has even greater scale. Thank you. Some other questions? Uh, thank you, colleagues. Mm. Uh, that was a wonderful set of presentations. Uh, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about comparing uh, uh, satellite technology to another technology that was developing at the time, uh, uh, undersea cables, uh, how those uh, two different technologies Thank you, I'll, I'll say a few words about that. In some ways, undersea cables is the oldest electronic trans, you know, trans oceanic technology dating back to uh, just before, but then very much just after the American Civil War. Uh, the way I think about this now, however, in the 21st century, is I see the fiber optic network and the undersea cables as uh, the giant information conveying machines of uh, planet Earth, and they carry a tremendous amount of data and bandwidth. Now, satellites, of course, carry a tremendous amount of data and bandwidth too, but satellites I see as more diverse, and they do more, they do a lot of communication things, but they do a lot of scientific uh, research things, they do surveillance uh, kinds of things, they're an incredible help to everything from disarmament to safety of life at sea to archaeological research and so on and so forth. And particularly, I think, in the past 20 to 30 years, you see this full growing out of a global information network, multiple forms and levels, in ways far beyond anything we had ever seen before in satellites and fiber optics on the ocean floors. are both giant components in that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, another session in uh, something like 10 minutes. Gentlemen, thank you very much to come here. And we hope to see you again.
when I say see you again uh, for the next anniversary in 50 years, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, let me let me give you uh, a commemorative medal from E uh, I Triple E. <laughs> you may need it. Please, this one and another one. This is this is a medal from French French Embassy. So from Paris, from France, it's for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I see you in uh, something like 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your patience.